and rationale why they assaulted me, <laughs> basically. But anyway, the, so I, the, the, what I learned from that, in addition to keeping your focus large, which is always what you're learning, is that when you do a, a faint, number one, two things. Number one, when you faint against a human, don't do it at combat speed. Make your faint real broad, like telegraph it, okay? Don't do it at combat speed. Mm -hmm. And number one, number two, don't faint to the head area. Mm -hmm. that, that, so if you goof up, you won't have a head strike, mm -hmm. you know, which you never hit a person in the head or, or neck unless it is a fatal force scenario. Right. Yeah. Well, the, uh, getting back on track to the, uh, to the 70s. But how long did you stay with, uh, what was her name? Call that. Call that. Call that. Um, till, uh, 73. 73? Mm -hmm. And what did you do at that point? Well, we broke up, and, uh, by then, I was destroyed. Totally destroyed. I mean, here I am now. I'm deep into downs now. Mm -hmm. They're addicting. Right. Uh, barbiturates are physiologically addicting. Uh, well, so are quaaludes, for that matter. But quaaludes are psychologically addicting to right. the, the hypnotic class of drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I had been taking those for two years heavily through her. A lot of them. And uh, and I'd lost my job, my good job. Mm -hmm. Gotten fired from that. My hair had grown long. I was totally fucked. I was homeless. It's just totally fucked. Totally fucked. So what did you do? Started working as in uh, what would now be called telemarketing, but it was no such thing then. Back then there was no telemarketing. Telephone sales really consisted of people uh, in phone rooms, boiler rooms they were known as, impersonating police officers, labor union officials, civic leaders, mm -hmm. and firefighters. That's what it was. You would be working in a FOP phone room and they would be detectives in there mm -hmm. with their guns and the phone men would be sitting around going, hey, <clears throat> Joe McBride, National Peace Officer Association. But also to appreciate a little support by I get you that sticker there with the uh, with the badge decal, put it beside your license plate there. I think you know uh, this doesn't give you a license to go uh, 90 miles an hour down the expressway or beat your wife, but I think you understand the police appreciate it. You'd never directly tell them you were a police officer generally, you just right. imply that you were. Right. Same with the firefighters, same with uh, labor union officials, you know, you'd say AFL, CIO, Teamsters, hey, we're putting together a book for our convention, supporting the kids at the same time, going to have the governor in, going to have a nice book to push across from them. I think you understand that any support you give to organized labor will never hurt you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. It's true. Back when my daddy was getting his head busted on Ford Overpass by comedy goons. Yeah. We used to have to throw a bomb once in a while, send the boys over there, turn that place into a parking lot. <laughs> Those days were long gone. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what it was back then. That's just, just a bunch of people impersonating. And it would be the JCs, the Junior Chamber of Commerce. They were notorious. Had you moved to Georgia at that point? Or? No, yeah, yeah. I, 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 then I moved to Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. What, I, by, I, what, 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 by what time frame were we talking about you moved to Atlanta? Uh, 73. Oh, no, uh, no, in 73 and uh, early 73. Early 73, you had yeah. moved to Atlanta? Yeah. That was when you and. Uh, yeah, it was uh, several months after we had broken up, and I was just homeless, and I was working phone deals. and down in Miami-Dade and getting my teeth cut. Miami-Dade, uh, or Miami, you know, Dade County right. was uh, really a hotbed of, of this type of stuff, uh, right. this type of phone fraud, if you will. And so was Atlanta, actually. A lot going on in Atlanta. But the reason I came up to Atlanta was I'd been born here, but yet it was the only place I hadn't been to. Because <laughs> I grew up on racetracks all around the country. I left Atlanta when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. My mother moved us to Tampa, and then a year later she married uh, my stepfather. And so I How old were you when she got remarried? Seven. Seven? Yeah. And uh, so it, in Atlanta, I, I was born here, but it was the one place I'd, I hadn't been. <laughs> yeah, 
and so I came here, and it uh, and there's a lot of fun jobs here then of, of that type, right. of that type, JCs, police, all kinds of police organizations. Mm -hmm. did, now you said phone fraud. Did did you actually? I mean, were you actually? The reason I call it here's, here's here's the difference between phone fraud then and and legal phone work. Right. And legal phone work. They took your money that they took from you, mm -hmm. and they passed it around and split it a bunch of a, amongst a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. Okay, in phone fraud, I take their money and keep it all myself. <laughs> okay, so, so. that's the difference. Can you dig it? You know, two percent would go to the cause. Right. One or two percent, literally, literally, one or two percent would go to the cause. And then it would be split among the room managers, the telemarketers, the leapers, the sponsor, the promoters, one else. So they'd, they'd take that basket of money and pass it around to everybody who takes some. That made it legal. And if you took the basket of money and just kept it all yourself, it was fraud. <laughs> okay, that's the difference. Right. So, yeah, that's why I call it fun fraud. It, it still is. I, I know of very few charities these days, actually, that are, are truly what people think they are. Right. Okay, truly, truly what people think they are. There's a few charities that... That 70% of what they collect goes actually to a cause, but most of these charities, uh, Easter Seals is a good example, and uh, most of the other ones, it's most of it is spent, most of the money they raise is spent raising the money. Right. It goes to the printers, they print the promotional items who are friends of the, you know, and they, they pay kickbacks, and it, it goes to the promoter, it goes to every, you know, it, a, a whole bunch of people take some of it, and it's usually more the reverse. Uh, these charities who are nationally known and everything uh, typically would be 30% to the cause, and if that much, uh, many of the charities you're being approached to even to this day, uh, police charities and so forth here in Georgia, if you'll read what they're doing, uh, only two or three, well they have to disclose it to keep themselves legal now, mm. and only two or three percent goes to the cause. Mm. Even now. Oh, but of course that stuff is sold and passe is just old timey and antiquated. Now, people are much more sophisticated in that respect, to say the least, mm -hmm. than, than they were 30 years ago. What kind of attracted you to getting involved in that? Oh, it's because you could work fucked up with long hair. It wasn't a job. Your parents wasn't a big deal and all that. No, you know? no. And you sit there with a glass of beer or, or you have your bottle of whiskey in your coat jacket or a wine cooler in a glass. Yeah, you could be fucked up on that stuff. I mean, the promoter would, would often advertise the job uh, and he would say, habits, okay, if you can afford them. Or if he was real strict on it, he would say, no habits. Hmm. Okay. And these jobs would be advertised in a billboard publication known as the Amusement Bulletin. And that was a, a the newspaper for outdoor expositions, state fairs, arenas, that kind of thing. And they had a phone. because. Quite often, the cause that you were pitching was going to be a benefit show, in in a benefit show or a state fair or something like that. So you'd be calling them up for the JCs, Sandy Springs JCs, a million of them, and and you would say, what we're doing is we're bringing in a country and western show. We want to bring in a lot of underprivileged kids to it. It's just a dollar a kid, and all the proceeds are going to the, the boys' farm, you know, the, the boys' ranch, right? And um, back then, of course, when you said underprivileged kid, it denoted a white child whose parents were drunk and mean and abusive, some poor little old burr-headed doll who had to wear raggedy clothes to school. His parents didn't treat him very good, that thing. It, it was, nowadays, you say underprivileged child, anyone knows it's going to be an African-American child out of the projects. Uh, you know. Now, look at Toys for Tots. Yeah, you really ought to see them distribute. You know this Marine Corps Toys for Tots? Uh, they distribute the toys typically. Uh, one location would be down there at the old Sears building on Pontalia, which is now City Hall, mm -hmm. City Hall East. And go down there and look at them distribute those toys. It'll be African Americans pulling up in, I kid you not, African Americans pulling up in Mercedes and Cadillacs going in there just loading up iron bolts of clothes, I mean uh, toys. Uh, walking out. That's what it is now. People are hip to that. But back then, an underprivileged child was just a poor white kid who was a good kid. He had just gotten a bad break. His daddy was in the penitentiary, you know, and his mom was a drunk, you know, that kind of thing. 
And so that's what it was. Oh, and anyway, the point is, we're bringing in a country in Western show. Hence the connection with the amusement bulletins, because that would be shows there. Sometimes you bring in a circus. You bring in a little one-ring circus, uh, put it on in the margin of a shopping center, just like a, a carnival or something. Mm -hmm. you know? Bring in a circus for the kids. Uh, children's Christmas shopping tour. You still see cruise for, for the cops. Uh, where they give the child the money and, 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 and you shop with a cop, you still see that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was this this last Christmas. Mm -hmm. I, I saw it. Yeah, it would be that. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd ask for ten dollars in and sponsor a job. I'm sure it's a lot more now. Yeah, right. and then have police officers in the room. Did you ever get back on your feet in Atlanta, or or I mean? You just, uh, you just continued to do that. And just no, well, yeah, I got back on my feet. I, well, I never did because uh, you know, I, oh, because I've been deep in the downs, mm -hmm. and now you know, you know, reality sitting me, and I can't, I can't get any more downs. And for a person that uh, has an addictive personality towards downs, well, what the problem is, uh, what makes a lot of alcoholics, uh, alcoholics and so forth, is that they have a high level uh, <coughs> of anxiety mm -hmm. within them. Mm -hmm. I've heard it expressed, the motor is all, you see this in heroin addicts too, uh, same thing. I don't mean your black fucked up heroin addicts, I mean white intellectual heroin addicts, you know, that manage their habit or their habit manages them. You have a high anxiety level, they can't turn the motor off, mm -hmm. okay? They can't relax. And the, the, the thing about what makes these alcohol and, and these uh, all all these central nervous system depressants so addictive is that here you have a person who has a hard time relaxing who has a hard time partying you might say has a hard time being loose is always anxious worried in my case it was just a high level of what they call existential anxiety which is the awareness of your future you know you're going to die and there's a psychiatric school of thought that says existential anxiety is responsible for most of our, our human neurosis yeah 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 because we're the only that bothered you back then you know, since i was four years old my earliest thoughts were of death and that i was going to die really? when i was four years old i could distinct i could place it because I, of the situation i was in when i thought it and I, when I was four years old, I looked. I can remember looking at my hand and pondering the fact that this hand one day will be a skeleton. Yeah, when I was four years old. Well, what was the situation, if you don't remember? No, it was an intellectual thought. It was the awareness of my future. Oh, okay. Being. The humans are the only animal that I know of that really has to cope with it, although it's really hard to tell. Um, hard to tell, but it's, it's a tremendous psychic load. Mm -hmm. It's... The, the, the knowledge uh, of our future non-being or of the inevitability of our death is the same is the thing that shapes our entire life. Mm -hmm. It is. Your life, my life, and everything else. It's the thing that is responsible for the activities you do or to escape do. from the thought. Or don't do, yeah. Okay? You're so busy. You have your family. You have your activities. You have your, your work. You have your church. What you're doing is running from existential anxiety. Yeah, yeah, if you stop for one second and, and there's nothing there to distract you like your kids and everything else are, that are, quote, the most important thing in the world to you. <laughs> and if that was just emptied out of your mind, the existential anxiety will catch up to you and it's just too absolutely horrifying without the, uh, without the comfort of believing in an afterlife, believing in supernatural ghost stories. You see, I mean, we have the president uh, of the United States, the most sophisticated and powerful country in the world, standing up there telling the world that he believes in a ghost story. Which is what? Jesus <laughs> Christ is and that kind of thing. Talking about Jesus. And that that's a ghost story. That is, that is of the supernatural, you know. And, and here we are, most advanced peoples ever. And, and we're talking about ghost stories, and they, they all do it. You see how stupid they are? They're total fucking idiots, but they're just being human beings. You see? They're just being human beings. They're running from their ex existential anxiety. That's what's responsible for you so busy, why you're wearing that tie, why you're devoting yourself to work for the betterment of society. Hey, son, forget it. <laughs> so we're doing Look, any, any good anthropologist can tell you we're damned, okay? And so can any cosmologist, too. It's just on a larger time scale, that's all. And so can any good geologist can tell you, hey, don't you know 
the, the supervolcano under Yellowstone, there's over 70 supervolcanoes. You don't even know what a supervolcano is. Check out pbs.org uh, PBS and get their, their show on supervolcanoes and they explain it to you. The supervolcano that is the Yellowstone Plateau, these things are so big that they're hundreds of square miles. They don't really have a crater. They, they have magma chambers that, that, that can take a, a million years to fill. The supervolcano under Yellowstone has erupted um, three times in, in the last two million years. It has an average cycle of 600,000 years. When it erupts, it basically wipes out uh, downwind the, the eastern part of the U.S. If, if you're looking at, at a map of the U.S., Yellowstone is here, and project a cone like this, and it basically blankets the, in, in a cone uh, the, the whole eastern seaboard of the U.S. under several feet of ash and would just destroy any civilization in that area. Well, listen, it's erupted three times uh, in the last uh, almost 200, uh, 2 million years. And guess what? It's got a cycle of 600,000 years. And guess what? It's been 630,000 years since it last erupted. That thing could pop off any minute, pal. Okay? They know the, they know the power of the meteor, meteor I'm always talking about. Yeah, Matt's always talking about Well, that's another thing. That, that is more unpredictable. It's going to happen, but when we don't know. We know this is going to happen. We know the time scale. Hey, check it out, the Olympic plate up there in the northwest, okay? In, in 1967, they had a, a mega, a, a, super, a, a super earthquake in Alaska, a, over nine points on the Richter scale. It's only the third one ever known to human beings. And in this case, they were able to observe the effects. Relatively few people were killed because at that time, Alaska was sparsely populated. Yeah, but ge sure. geologists had an idea of what a mega, over 0.9 earthquake would do, geologically speaking, but they were only theories and they were able to study the effects of this confirmant. And they have found that the Olympic plate uh, has, in, in the last, uh, last 20,000 years, in the last 20,000 years, has, has, has shook itself out with a plus 0.9 earthquake 18 times. Mm. <laughs> okay? And not only have they confirmed it, they, geologic, uh, you know, by study, what they've done really to really get it precise is, is they always had a theory that underwater you have the continental shelf under the ocean, you have the continental shelf and then it goes down to the depths of the ocean. And in that were kind of like ravines, sort of, or canyons. Mm -hmm. And geologists had a theory that a mega quake would make undersea earth slides on that and it would leave a record. And so they were able to